The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. Karen, you were telling me that people really enjoyed the Atari video music episode? Yeah, people seemed really interested in old obscure electronics. Hmm. Can you think of any other old obscure electronics that we could use for a build? How about mechanical television? Wait, how can a television be mechanical? Oh, it can be. Let me explain. Okay, mechanical TV. You would have a light here, and that would shine through a spinning disc with holes in it called a Nipkow disc. This would go through a lens. There would be four sensors in an array, and then a subject, and that's obviously who you're filming. What happens is the spinning disc causes spots, flying spots, to scan across the person line by line, very much like pixels today, or a CRT electron beam. So what happens is, the amount of light bounced back by the spot gets picked up by the sensors and that's your pixel value. So that's how the camera works. Then down here we have the screen, so to speak. There's a neon tube and that glows to the brightness of the pixel value sent to it. It shines through another spinning disc, which is hopefully synchronized to the first disc. It goes through a lens and then it creates a small image, usually only a couple inches wide. So even if you had this big console the size of a 1950s TV, if it was a mechanical TV, it would be mostly spinning disc with a very small screen attached. So basically it used persistence of vision to transmit an image over radio waves which is pretty much how a CRT, a more modern type of TV works. This is just done mechanically at a low resolution. So I'm thinking we do this as a two part episode. In part one, we'll build the imaging device that picks up the image. And then in part two, a few weeks from now, we'll build the screen that shows the image. That looks like it's gonna be really fun to try to build. Yeah, hopefully it works out. Do we have anything else going on in this episode? Yeah, we do. Oh. We're gonna do a Tetris challenge on our new giant Game Boy to <gasps> see which one of us is the Tetris champion. Mm, that should be fun. Yeah, and we're gonna have a research segment for next week's episode. Okay, sounds like a lot to get done. We better get started. Amazing hacks. Where are my dragons? Inspired designs. Oh, look, I knocked some hot glue loose. Regrettable acting. I want to live in a world with Star Wars again! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Tired of buying records at the music shop? Well, now you can join the Columbia House Record Club. For only $20 a month, we'll send you hits like Kenny Rogers, Barbara Streisand, The Lord's Prayer, and A Child's Introduction to Life in Japan and Burma. Call now. No, actually, these are just records that I got from a few different thrift stores. My thought was, since we need a spinning disc in order to make the mechanical television, hey, look, spinning discs. And we should be able to drill holes into them to make the you know light apertures without them cracking like a CD or a laser disc would. So I drew a LP into the computer here, and then I drew a series of holes in it. And this is what we're going to use for the scanning dots. So let me show you how this is gonna work. We have uh, 24 holes here, and we space them out. They're 16 inch holes, and they overlap each other a little bit, and there's a total height of about 2.5 inches. Okay, so this would be your viewing window right here. And when the disc rotates, watch the dots go across the screen, and it's kind of like scan lines on a modern you know, computer or something. It's really actually a lot closer to an electron beam on a CRT, whereas the beam would start at the upper left, draw one line, draw the next, draw the next, and the dots are basically doing the same thing. So if they spin fast enough, it should create some sort of a persistent image. So what we can do is we can take this and cut out a paper pattern on the laser and then use that paper pattern to drill holes in a record and then try spinning it. We're not sure if cutting the record in the laser is the best idea, so that's why we're gonna use a paper pattern to do it. Karen and I used Math and Adobe Illustrator to put all the holes into a design. So before we continue, we should probably figure out a way to spin a record. Yes. I guess there's lots of ways to spin a record, but we need to do it very really quickly. So I have a box of DC motors. Mm. I don't know if we're gonna find anything that will work, but okay. we'll try. We'll mock it up, and then once we find something that seems appropriate, 
We'll put this into a jig in the CNC machine, drill the little holes, and then also probably drill four holes in a square in the center. Then we can make a 3D printed piece that locks into the center along with those holes, making it rotate very nicely, and then attach it to a motor. That sounds good. Yeah. So how fast does this need to spin? Well, if the dots are creating one frame per revolution, I would say we need at least at least 15 frames a second or okay. 15 revolutions per second in order to create motion. However, since we need persistence of vision as well, I would say probably at least 60 revolutions per second. Oh. What would that be? 3,600 RPM? Okay. All right, well, let's see how fast we can spin this at least. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we grab the oscilloscope and then we're gonna hook it up and see if we can get an RPM signal off of this yellow wire here. Okay. So this is how your computer would know that your fan has failed or not. Mm -hmm. So what signal do you need to check coming out of that yellow wire? Well, you know, I've actually never done this with a fan before, um, but I assume this is some sort of RPM signal that tells okay. your computer how fast the fan is going. Because you know, if you go into the BIOS, it tells you. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see if there's anything on this. The RPMs probably aren't consistent because mm -mm. you know we have taped a record to it. <laughs> we didn't tape it, we hot glued it. Oh, uh, yeah. It's better. Check it out. There's a, we sort of got a number here. So it looks like we're going from about 18 to 22. So all we need to do is make this about three times faster. And I think we'll have plenty of speed. So how do you recommend we do that? Max ran to the store and found the cheapest drills he could find. So we had random motors laying around, but we needed two of the same motor so we could synchronize them as close as possible. So we bought two very cheap drills. Hyper tough? I kind of doubt it. So see, we can get some parts out of these drills. There might even be a circuit inside of it. Ooh, look at that. The super tough charging stand. NICAD batteries are kind of old school, but the nice thing about them is you can just pretty much apply voltage and charge them. It's dead simple. And you can actually get a really good discharge from a NICAD versus other types. Let's see what's inside the hyper tough drill. Probably the answer to all life's problems. You have received a copyright strike from Hyper Tough Tools Inc. Mm, pretty good sized motor. And this metal thing. Oh wait, that's not metal, that's plastic. What? Who am I kidding? Oh no, Hyper Tough broke. So you've got your uh, planetary gearbox here, which does your torque. And then there's probably a timer circuit inside of this, but it's all pretty straightforward. Oh, there's an LED work light. Very useful. I don't want to snip this off. Then we'll have ourselves a new motor. Bobby Dazzler. We're going to attach the record to a DC motor that we have laying around from a drill. I'm just gonna hot glue it in place for now. We're just trying to test out the theory. Then I use the laser to cut the pattern for the Nipkow disc. We can't cut the record itself because that would create toxic gas inside of the laser. So we're going to just tape the pattern to the record and drill it manually. You know, same effect. So here are the pixels, so to speak. And of course there's gonna be a little window like this. What, we should look at an area like this as we spin it up to speed okay. and see if it looks fast enough. Now, this is a- uh, Get a piece of paper or something and actually cut a window and just hold it over it. I guess Or like this. some ear. So that way if it explodes, I'll lose both my hands. That seems quite fast enough. Yeah, I think so. Woo! Whoa, trippy. Nice! There we go. So we saw a blur of white, and that's going to be what's on the image disc. So for the scanning disc, it kind of works the same way. Um, light is emitted through the holes, and if you watch, it will scan across the subject line by line, row by row. The subject being Karen's hand in this example. So what we do on the um, imaging end is we'll have some photocells and they will pick up the amount of light hitting the subject. And again, the subject will be basically in darkness. So the only thing the photos will see or the photocells will see is the flying spot going across the subject. And by taking that analog value and synchronizing it with the disc and then putting it to the image disc, it should recreate the image the same way mechanical television did like 90 years ago. Let's play some game, man. Every so often, we need to take a break from the fast paced schedule of producing the Ben Heck Show. So we're gonna play Giant Game Boy. We can see who can get the highest score on Tetris, Felix, Karen, or myself. Let's play. Interesting strategy there, Mr. Heckendorn. Oh, turd bucket. <laughs> oh, 
Whoa, this could be the end. Oh! oh, that's not what I intended to do. That's too bad. Looks like I lose. <laughs> Done. Uh. Okay, the results of the 2016 Tetris World Championships Madison area. At level nine difficulty, in third place, Felix with 866 points. Second place, Karen, 8,173 points. And in first place, Ben with 20,654 points. All right, well everyone, good game. Let's get back to work. <laughs> Now it's time for a research update. We're doing a Lunchbox Dev Kit episode and I'm trying to find a medium sized HDMI screen for it. Now it's pretty easy to get like a seven inch LCD screen with HDMI. I think Element 14 has a few. And of course 20 inches on up is pretty common, computer monitors, TVs. But between seven and 20 is kind of a wasteland. But there was a thing called the Motorola Atrix. Here it is on eBay. This was, you know, a smartphone from a couple years ago, nothing too remarkable. But the cool thing is there was a dock for it. Check this out. You put the phone into the dock and then it would become almost like a little laptop. See that? It's obsolete now, but you can still buy these docks. They've got about an 11 inch screen, which is, you know, pretty close to a standard laptop size. And there's even batteries and a keyboard and USB ports built into the base. So you get a lot of cool stuff. So I think I'm gonna order one of these and rip it apart. And we can use that for the Lunchbox Dev Kit. And now, back to the build. This is my first attempt at a light sensor array. We have a photoresistor in each corner and they're wired in parallel, which should average out their values, making them act like one big photo cell. However, a photoresistor may not quite be fast enough for what this project needs. I guess we'll find out. We may need to switch to a photodiode later on, but I don't have any of those in stock right now, so this is gonna have to do. I've got the four photoresistors hooked up kind of like a uh, you know picture frame. And I printed off this checkerboard pattern and I'm going to hopefully use it with the flying spot detector. If you take a look, I'm just you know, pretty much doing anything in front of these sensors causes them to change because um, they're in parallel, which means the light is averaged out between all of them. So what I think I wanna do next is rig up the record to spin here. Maybe not with the final motor, but I don't know. And we'll shine a light through it to get the flying spot going. Then we'll set this up uh, at a fixed distance on a uh, flat piece of material. And then what we can do is we can scan the flying spot across the checkerboard and then look at the output of the photoresistors with an oscilloscope and see if we can detect a pattern based off of the checkerboard. I'm using foam core here to cut out a frame for the motor and the record so they can sit and spin at a 90 degree angle. This will project the dots forward onto the subject. 
I just need to make this rigid enough so it doesn't wobble too much when the motor's up to speed, although we'll probably have the motors running at a much slower rate in the final product. It's a little wobbly, but it should be okay. All right, so for the next step, I'm going to attach these flashlights. I found these at the hardware store. These will be good because then they have a nice consistent beam and they use a single LED. So there isn't too much optical distortion from the actual you know, lens around it. That was a little bit, but it should be pretty consistent. Okay, so yes, we want the beam to be tight enough that we can get both the top and the bottom dots. And the closer I put the flashlight to the record, the brighter it'll be, although it may be slightly out of focus, so that's something else we'll have to consider. So if I change the distance of the flashlight, see how it changes the focus on the subject? See, if the subject is about three feet from the disc, the dots become kind of large, and as you know, those represent the pixels. If you bring the, the flashlight back, they become smaller, which is probably what we want. So. Yeah, I'm gonna go with the maximum distance on the flashlight just to make sure that the dots are focused better. So I'm gonna bring the flashlight about this far back, focus it in as far as I can here, and that should give us a sharper dot here. I'm going to attach the sensor frame and the spinning disc to this piece of pegboard to create a fixed camera system. Well, Karen, we got the first half of the episode done. We built a device that spins up the disc, creates a flying spot on a subject, and then picks up that light level to transmit to the screen. Mm -hmm. And your idea to use the vinyl record seemed to work really well. Yeah, um, you can get them for very cheap at a thrift store. We couldn't actually buy material that cheap as right. the old record. So recycling, plus you already know they're round. Reuse! And I didn't stick them in the laser. Thank you because that would be bad. So that we don't poison us and corrode our laser. Do you like how I had the one piece of paper and I drilled two records at the same time? That's good. Very green. That's all the time we have for today. In a future episode, we're gonna come back to this project and build the screen that actually reproduces the image picked up by the camera. If you have any questions about today's build, let us know in the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TBHS. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Google+. Remember, you can also read about our upcoming episodes, builds, and special events on element14.com forward slash TBHS. We'll see you next time, maybe on a mechanical TV. Max, this one's for you. The fact that we've been recording without doing anything. Are you recording right now? It's for you, Max. You're recording right now, aren't you? I don't know. It's just we're making, <laughs> we're building a primitive camera with foam core. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. Today's episode is all about William Defoe. No, Sorry. no, it's not. You'll live yeah. just long enough to see your laser turned into a hunk of junk, and then you'll die sad and alone. Mm -hmm. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.